Welcome to the Age of Fission radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good afternoon. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission Radio. And I want to thank you for joining us and thank all of our affiliates who carry our show on the various podcast venues. And I especially want to give KEPW 97.3 FM LP here in Eugene and Springfield a little shout out. They're an FM radio station carrying Really, one of, they're one of the only stations that I know of that will carry shows that talk about the truth about the nuclear industry. So I really appreciate it. And today I'm very excited to have back on my show Mr. Carl Grossman. He's an author and journalism professor at the State University of New York College of Old Westbury. He's also a board member of Beyond Nuclear. So when he talks about nuclear, he's been working on these things for many years and has published many books on this. I strongly suggest that you go to his website, carlgrossman.com, that's K-A-R-L-G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N.com. Look around at the venues and definitely download a free copy of the book, Cover Up, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. It's right there on his page. So without further ado, thank you, Carl, for joining us. A pleasure to be with you, Lonnie. Um, I really, I ha- and I'm going to tell this to my listeners again. You are actually the reason that I am doing this podcast. I heard you on Helen Caldicott's "If You Love This Planet," an old podcast that was going on, I think, between 2011 and 14 or something like that. You were a guest, and you said basically in 2012, if everyone needs to get active, that Fukushima is so big, every single person needs to get active, and that we're so used to telling ourselves no, that we don't matter. And you encouraged all all of the listeners to just put that aside and get active. Do what you think you can do, and that led me here. So I want to thank you for that. It's changed my life. Well, I'm thrilled to to know that that's what was your inspiration, my uh, yeah. my work. Well, I really, uh, you know, you offered to. I, we t- we're talked. We've talked about this, and I've talked about this many times on my radio show about the space force. How Donald Trump did not invent the idea of the space force. A lot of people think, oh, he's the new messiah and he's bringing us into the new era. But you're an expert on this. You wrote a book called Weapons in Space, which you gave me permission to read, which I did read on my podcast. But why don't you go into that a little bit since we just allocated billions of dollars towards it and they are moving full steam ahead with it. Yeah, well, it's 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 truly happening. Uh, Trump signed the National Defense Authorization Act for $738 billion. This is December 20th, and part of that was the establishment of a a sixth branch of U.S. armed forces, uh, a space force. And, uh, I mean, just in a matter of, of weeks, wow, the uh, the Trump people and the Pentagon have been moving ahead, full-throated uh, push now, for the Space Force, uh, uh, there was a recent piece in uh, the Space Trade Journals about how uh, soon they're going to be changing the name of some of the um, U.S. Air Force bases to U.S. Space Force bases. Uh, I'm just looking here. This is on Amazon. Some uh, company in Texas is selling uh, T-shirts uh which uh, says US Space Force and then the uh, the the subtitle is uh, make the galaxy great again i mean uh, some of these you got to uh, be kidding uh, extreme yeah no just go to amazon and uh, 
It's 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 called Gun Show Tees, an American company. Wow. And it says we, we screen and print our own shirts in Texas, USA. Most importantly, we believe in what we put on our shirts so you can be confident you are buying from people like you. And, uh, wow. well, uh, among the other shirts, too, is CNN is fake news. Wow. I mean, d d just go right, there. go right to Amazon. Uh, and uh, there's one about, uh, let's see if I can find it, about the wall uh, that Trump wants to uh, build, uh, you know, advocating that and so forth. So it's, a, it's an arch right-wing entity or company. But this Space Force thing, it's, it's beyond T-shirts. It's beyond uh, renaming U.S. Air Force bases. It's going to, uh, well, unless it's stopped, uh, and Bruce Gagnon, who was the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, which listeners should to, to check out right away, talking about getting active and yeah, that's getting called, involved that website's in these called, issues. The website's Space for, uh, Space for Peace, and that's the number four. And so you don't right, have to spaceforpeace.org. Yeah. Yeah, it's an international organization, uh, been around since 1992. I uh, was part of the, the founding of the global network, very active. Uh, they hold protests, international meetings, and so forth. And he, he feels the Achilles heel, that's how he uh, terms it, the Achilles heel of this Space Force scheme is uh, is the money. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, ultimately. And uh, he feels that if people are aware of what's gone gone down. I mean, what Trump has done in establishing a space force, unless it's stopped, and, and as I note, the, the global network has been in the lead in, uh, in challenging moves through the years to, to uh, well, turn space, turn the heavens into a, into a war zone. Unless it's stopped, uh, there's going to be a kind of new world for us and our children and their children Space, which, well, the Outer Space Treaty, and, and that's key here, that was a landmark treaty enacted in 1967. Uh, it's been signed on to by virtually all the countries of, uh, of the world. It, it was constructed by the United States, the former Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and the, uh, the focus of the Outer Space Treaty is, I mean, listeners have probably heard the term uh, uh, keep space for peaceful purposes and so forth, that call, all comes out of the Outer Space Treaty. It, uh, it designates space as a global commons for use for peaceful purposes. And, uh, well, it's held for, you know, for decades. Uh, and uh, if this Space Force thing moves ahead, if it's not stopped as it should be stopped, uh Space is going to become a new arena of war, and uh, there's been an effort for decades by our neighbor Canada, by China, and by Russia to expand the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, now the Outer Space Treaty has said there could be no weapons of mass destruction in space, and what Canada, Russia, and China have been trying to do through another treaty, it's called the Paros Treaty, Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space Treaty is to extend it to all weapons and truly keep space a place for peace. Uh, but if, if if the U.S. moves ahead, as it seems to be doing, uh, and it is not stopped with this U.S. Space Force, uh, just watch uh, China and Russia and then other nations uh, meeting us in kind and, and, space, uh, and space becomes a a war zone, well, and it's why, why the Paros, why the Paros Treaty, isn't uh, there right now with the Outer Space Treaty, is that at the United Nations, and I've been there to see this. The United States, the U.S. ambassador, votes no when it comes up for a vote. This is year after year, uh, despite who the president is, and the U.S. effectively vetoes the Paros Treaty at the U.N. 
Now what's occurring is that Trump, uh, despite this record by China and Russia to expand the Outer Space Treaty and to keep space for, for peace, what uh, the United States is claiming, the Trump and the Pentagon are claiming, uh, the Trump administration is that uh, China and Russia are moving up into space militarily, and we have to uh, we have to be up there too with a, well, Carl, a U.S. Did, did, space force. You, didn't your book your book outlined the vision for 2020, the Pentagon document that said that the United States plans on having supremacy in the outer atmosphere, and that in that document, I mean, I remember reading it; I was dumbfounded that it said basically the United States has the right to, you know, all the assets around the uh, upper atmosphere and that we plan on, even if we have to perpetrate piracy, that that's allowed. So they're sort of inviting war out in outer space if they plan on, like, stealing, you know, if people go mining on the asteroids and they plan, you know, China or Russia goes mining on some asteroid in outer atmosphere and then they start bringing it back to Earth, the United States basically plans on stealing it from them. Isn't that like an invitation to war? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, th- th- this is a great, uh, oh, uh, a very profitable, uh, uh, a, yeah. f- a greatly lucrative yeah. uh, prospect for the aerospace companies. And in regard to what uh, what you're saying, uh, and, and you mentioned before, this goes way back, and it, and and it does go way back. In fact, it goes back to the Nazi scientists who were brought right. to the United States after World War II, the, particularly the Nazi rocket scientists like Werner von Braun, who uh, was involved in the design and development of the V-2 rocket. Well, they, they were brought to uh, the U.S. and it was a thing called Project Paperclip. Right. That was the undertaking. A, a thousand were brought here. And Vern, Werner von Braun and... Uh, uh, his collaborators uh, were, were brought to the um, the Redstone Army Arsenal in uh, in Alabama, and there they designed a, a U.S. military rocket called the Redstone, which in fact was a was a replica was a replica of the the V two rocket, and they uh, wow. uh, they were very involved in um, the design of what became the. U.S. space program, and I, I write about this in um, my book, Weapons in Space, right. and many of my articles uh, Didn't they, if I recall it in, in, right, in great they, start, detail. they started NASA, right? The, all of those people were like... Well, uh, uh, they, they, they didn't exactly start NASA, but Werner von Braun became the associate director of NASA. Uh, NASA was created, uh, this is right after uh, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 57 and 58. Uh, but uh, they were involved in space strategy. In fact, there was a, a, a Nazi general, Walter Dornberger. He was in charge of the entire Nazi Germany rocket program. And uh, he was a consultant to the Air Force, a consultant to the uh, Department of Defense. It goes way back into the late 40s. And uh, he designed a program of having uh, uh, using nuclear technology, orbiting uh, nuclear weapons in space, uh, which on command could be uh, shot back down at the Earth and so forth. Uh, in fact, and the Air Force proceeded with um, uh, a program that was called NABS for Nuclear uh, Ballistic Systems uh, Program to, um, uh, to, uh, to make real uh, what uh, this Nazi general had. Uh, and again, it's an excellent book, besides my weapons in space and my writing, uh, I suggest that uh, listeners uh, catch the book Arming the Heavens by Professor Jack Mano. He's also, like myself, a State University of New York professor. And he, he's documented all this important history in regard to the U.S. space program, uh, the, Nazi, uh, the, the Nazi Foundation. But what you're talking about is, is, uh, is a, in terms of... Uh, Oh, the moon and so forth is a is a report, uh, and you can get it. You can go to Amazon. You can get it used. You, you'll, you'll be so shocked. And I have it right in front of me. It's called Military Space Forces: The Next Fifty Years, and it's in the form of a book. But essentially, it was an extensive report commissioned by the U.S. It says right here, commissioned by the U.S. Congress 
And then right in the front of it, where they have like a little introduction and, and signatures and so forth, are the signatures of various um, facsimile signatures of various senators. And uh, uh, here, I'm just looking at it here. Uh, Ike Skelton of Missouri, right. Bill Nelson of Florida. These are facsimiles of, of their signatures. Uh, John Kasich of Ohio. Uh, it goes on and on. Some are Democrats, some are Republicans. And the book goes on, or this congressional plan for space goes on, uh, talking about uh, the importance of um, having a U.S. military base on the moon. And, and this is despite, after the Outer Space Treaty, there was a second treaty, and this was passed. It was called the Moon Treaty. And it, uh, it, it sets aside the moon exclusively for peaceful purposes. It makes it very clear. The moon is not for a base for military operations. Nevertheless, this, this report uh, proposes that there be a U.S. base or bases on the moon. And here I'm just reading from the report, page 21. The moon is rich in many natural resources, sodium, potassium, carbon compounds. And then it talks about uh, uh, using the moon for uh, uh for fighting, uh, quoting from the book, page 27. And again, this, this is done without tax dollars by right. Congress. And they have it was, every plan. It was put out in 19... 19- so, Carl, is there any it, way it, that we can just, stop this, do you think? I mean, is that plan, is it like non-stoppable? Is there anything that we can do? I mean, our, 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 both Democrats and Republicans voted for this. Most of them funded this idea. Well, I mean, this is just one element in this push by the United States, I'm ashamed to say, uh, to uh, oh, to oh, turn the heavens into into a war zone. I mean, Reagan's Star Wars program was, um, uh, which uh, which almost came about, was I mean, there what Reagan wanted under Star Wars or the Strategic Defense Initiative is what it was called. Um, he uh, and and then so that book comes out after Reagan's Star Wars program in '89, but Reagan's Star Wars uh, plan. This is the early '80s when Reagan became president and was uh, oh he was stimulated to uh, develop a uh, uh, his Star Wars program by Edward Teller, uh, the father of the hydrogen bomb, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean. Uh, that was predicated. In fact, that's probably what the Space Force, if it's not stopped, will end up making use of, orbiting battle platforms I'm with sure that's hypervelocity real guns. I'm sure that's the real Yeah, hyper, hypervelocity guns, particle beams, and, and laser weapons on the battle platforms above our heads and also above our heads under this is Star Wars. And, again, this is – I am – all but sure, this is the architecture of what the space force would uh, would deploy in uh, uh, in its uh, well in its deployment of weapons in space, and energized by nuclear reactors and super plutonium systems. Wow! Above our heads. In fact, James Abramson, who was the commander of the Strategic Defense Initiative, said, "Unless we have." Super plutonium systems and reactors in orbit on these battle platforms. We're going to have to have a long light cord, meaning they meant an extension cord, going down to uh, to Earth uh, and uh, bringing up power because hypervelocity gun guns and laser weapons and so on. Uh, particle beams require a lot of a uh, lot of power, and only uh, uh, nuclear reactors up in space on these battle platforms can. Couldn't provide it. So I mean, it, it starts with the Nazis. It goes on with with Reagan and his uh, Star Wars plan uh, under the uh, the Bush uh, George W. Bush administration with Rumsfeld, who was really into uh, deploying uh, well weapons and getting the U.S. up there in space. Uh, uh, and and uh, now you have uh, have the Space Force. And between all this, there's been lots of, of, of military documents, for example, Vision for 2020. Right. And you can go online and you can actually see and read Vision for 2020. This was a report done by the U.S. Space Command, uh, 
right. which was uh, that's in your book, which Weapons was involved, for Space. People should get your book, yeah, well, the, Weapons for, Weapons in Space. They really, it's not a thick it was, uh, book. It's maybe a hundred pages. It's not very many pages. It is chock full of information. If it, you know, like this is the thing that really intrigues me. You wrote that book ten years ago, I guess. You know, at least, and oh, well, twenty years ago, yeah. twenty years ago. I mean, but uh, and, the information uh, is still pertinent because they're still planning on go. Like they are moving ahead. I think what they've waited for is for the American people to just become docile. I mean, as you see, these you know now they can create the Space Force T-shirts as if that's something that we want. Like we want to make space great again. You know what I mean? Like or make the, make the galaxy. Great. I mean, it's it's just it's such. This isn't a movie. This, I mean, Star Wars right. has been a very successful series of uh, of Hollywood films, but this ain't no movie. This is exactly. uh, turning space into a war zone at enormous expense. It's kind of like and then consider suicide. if they, and, and and then consider if if there's an exchange. Russians up there, the Chinese up there, we're up there, the Indians will be up there, the Pakistanis will be up there, with nuclear-powered battle platforms up there and so forth. And if there's an exchange of the debris, and a lot of it would be radioactive, raining down, I mean, in torrents to the earth below, uh, some of the debris would stay up there. So if, if some listeners now are big space enthusiasts, uh, Trekkies, well, consider that, you know, after an exchange, after a, a space war, there'd be so much debris up there that uh, you would not be able to get a rocket up and out into space for uh, for mo- many many millennium. And in terms of the uh, the impacts on the Earth itself of space war, uh, the uh, the use of well, the Vision for 2020 report. Again, I detail it in my books. In fact, I. I reprint the cover of it, which shows a laser weapon up in space. This is the U.S. Space Command's vision uh, zapping a target on Earth below. And it it, it, it goes on about uh, how uh, the U.S. needs to seize the ultimate high ground, the high ground of space, and from space, thus uh, control, that's the word uh, used over and over again, the, the planet the planet below, and then it compares this scheme, this plan, uh, and it's the U.S. Space Command was just reactivated last year, and it's the foundation of the space force. Uh, you know, it goes on to compare this scheme, this plan, to how centuries ago, I mean, it's, it, it, here without, without taxpayer dollar, you can see it in this, uh, in, in this plan, this, uh, this, this, uh, Vision for 2020, and we're in 2020 now, incidentally. Uh, this vision for 2020. That's why they're rolling uh, you know, it, it out now. About how, they had every intention well, of they, meeting their deadlines. <laughs> they had some deadline. Uh, and they talk about how the great, this is in Vision for 2020, the great nations of Europe had these fleets, talking about the imperial nations, uh, England and Holland, and France, had these great fleets centuries ago, and by controlling the waves, they were able to these these ships. They were able to control the planet, and wow. the United States, by controlling space, will be able to this ultimate high ground will give us a a way to uh, with weapons up in space to control the planet below. Now the uh, the thing they don't seem to get is that Russia and China, despite their uh, their push. Uh, and I, I, I've, I've been to China. I've been several times to Russia. I mean, I've been on this issue for so many years. They do not want to blow their national treasuries on. Uh, this is like not like a Bradley fighting vehicle. Uh, having a space weaponry is going to be billions and billions and tens oh, yeah. of billions. Well, that's what yes, ultimately yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, it's been described by. Uh, Proponents of it, we're talking about the aerospace companies, as the uh, and this has been published in the, in the trade journals. And Bruce Gagnon often cites this as the biggest industrial enterprise in the history of the world, weaponizing weaponizing the heavens. Uh, and so and again, this, this has been percolating for, for for many years. 
hasn't hasn't happened. But now, now it's a it's about to happen unless it's stopped, uh, cut off at the pass by uh, our representatives uh, in Congress saying no to Trump trying to uh, get the the many billions of dollars needed for it. But that doesn't seem help, hopeful because the vote in the House of Representatives. This was on December 11th uh, for the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes a space force, was 189 Republicans and 188 Democrats for it, almost as many exactly. Democrats as for it. Exactly. Uh, only, only six Republican House members voted no, along with 41 Democrats. Now, this is interesting. The New York Times reported th- this that the key to getting those Democrats to vote for a space force was, uh, and I'll just read from the New York Times, Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law and advisor, was pivotal. It was Mr. Kushner who helped, and I'm quoting from the Times here, broker a deal to create the space force, a chief priority of the president's in exchange for paid parental leave, a measure championed by his wife, Ivanka Trump also a senior advisor to the president. And incidentally, paid parental leave for government employees is, I mean, that, that, that's common all over the world. But these Democratic Congress people uh, in, this, in this deal uh, voted to go for, with a space force. They voted to join in with the Republicans to open space uh, for war in exchange for, for parental leave. What a, what a deal. Well, even that was Senate, a sour was deal because it wasn't for everybody. It was only for federal workers. It wasn't for everyone. Yeah. So, I mean, they basically no. have sold the, us out. But that's their excuse because they've been bought out by lobbyists. I mean, this... The, and, and by the, aero, it, yeah, the but aerospace it, industry. Uh, l- l- let me note that the vote in the Senate was even worse for the Space Force. It was 86 to 8. Some 48 Republicans, wow. 37 Democrats, and one independent voted for it, and only four Republicans and four Democrats voted no. So we're going to have to, in in the weeks and the months ahead, and this is where the global network is so important, uh, and uh, the organization on whose board I sit, Beyond Nuclear, uh, will be active in this too, is to educate members of Congress to what they were supporting and the consequences. As I say... Vision for 2020 may, uh, well, uh, claim that in the year 2020, by the U.S. moving up into space uh, with weaponry, with lasers and hypervelocity guns and particles, I mean, just just following up with what uh, Reagan started and earlier the the Nazis, uh, the Nazi scientists brought here, uh, gave the uh, the U.S. inspiration to do. Uh, the U.S. is not going to be able to control the no. ultimate high ground of space. Russia, China, they're just not going to allow well, it. Right even though that, Carl, they're not even thinking about, this isn't like 30 years ago where there wasn't hundreds of, you know, 10,000 satellites circling the Earth. You know, what, what will happen if something goes awry? Like accidents happen with weapons. Just accidents, not intentional accidents, but things go wrong. Yeah. And we're, it's not like we have the ability, you know, there's putting things up there, but they don't have the ability to stop, say, maybe a, collu- a collusion, coll- 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 collision with some one of these satellites. What, what would happen if one of their, you know, lasers or something that had some nuclear components on it collided with a, I mean, and then, on, I mean, you know they wouldn't say anything to us. I mean, that's the weird part is, like, they've got this whole secret program going on and we're on a need-to-know basis and we don't need to know. And they won't even tell us when our children are being attacked. I mean, it's to me it's incomprehensible. My question to you is, is it do we put in a concerted effort to contact our elected officials? Is that where we start with our elected officials who voted for this program to voice our concerns? I would. I, I, I... Well, I, I, I think I think uh, I mean th- th- this is so massive. This push with the the uh, well, for example, Vision for 2020 lists scores of aerospace corporations would help, which worked with the uh, U.S. Space Command in developing the scheme. So you have the the massive uh, power 
of these aerospace corporations and their contributions uh, to uh, uh, to politicians and so forth. So I think it has to be uh, resistance on a very broad scale. There has to be uh, an effort to educate, if you could, some of the politicians, uh, vote some of these politicians out. Uh, in fact, a lot of them out if they if they don't if they don't get it. Uh, do th- work on, at the grassroots. I mean, uh, the uh, Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space is an international grassroots organization. Every every year they hold their their international conference in another country, and the, in the spring it'll be actually in Ottawa and Canada. Uh, they've had their conferences all over the world. And there's people from all over the world there. And, and people have to um, uh, mobilize, and people have to learn about all this, and people have to get active, and uh, people have to get their governments to uh, uh, not cooperate with the, for example, the government of New Zealand. This is just two months ago, uh, passed a uh, a law saying that no New Zealand space activity can contribute can contribute to war in space or the use of nuclear technology in space. I mean, great for green New Zealand, and I'm sure the United States, which considers New Zealand uh, an ally, is going to try to twist the arm of the arms of, of, of uh, officials in New Zealand to somehow reverse that. But that's the kind of thing that has to happen. Uh, governments, other governments have to say no to this. Let's keep space for peace. It's bad enough that humanity has a history of millennia, millennia of war, war, war on the surface of the planet. Are we going to extend war to space? People have to say no. They have to point to the outer space, uh, outer space treaty. I mean, in um, oh, uh, weapons in space, uh, in a uh, TV documentary I did. And in fact, I just all yesterday, I was shooting a new television documentary it's titled trump's space force uh opening the heavens to war and that'll be on free speech tv uh on my uh i have this nationally uh, aired tv program called enviro close-up with carl grossman and in a few weeks you'll be able to see in fact it's being edited today uh you're going to be able to see uh that that video and in that video is an interview i did uh, with Craig Eisentroff, he's a uh, uh, he, he was a young U.S. State Department officer, and he explains the history way back in the 60s, and uh, uh, he explains that uh, Soviets had just done Sputnik in 57, and in the uh, in, in the U.S. State Department, they wanted to, as as Mr. Eisentroff explains it, we wanted to. Avoid having weapons in space. De-weaponize space, says Mr. Eisentroff, before it got weaponized. And that was the the genesis of the Outer Space Treaty. We have to go back fully. The world has to go back fully. Uh, though most of the world wants to stay there with the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, and uh Go to the Paros Treaty as well, the Prevention of his Arms Race in Outer Space Treaty, and uh, again, keep space for peace. Bad enough, there's been all this war and death and destruction on this planet. Let's let's not move, let's not move war into space. And 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 the poor thinking on this. I mean, and for example, in Weapons of Space, I, I, I talk about keynoting a conference. On uh, it was on prevention of an arms race in outer space at the United Nations in Geneva, and I was the keynote speaker. Actually, I was followed by the Chinese ambassador, and uh, we both spoke about the importance of keeping space for peace. And the next day, the next day, um, there was a vote on this Paris Treaty, and I went to uh, watch the vote, uh, and on my way to the. Uh, uh, main uh, building of it's the old League of Nations headquarters, actually in Geneva, that the UN uses. Uh, where Haile Selassie, very famously, uh, in the 1930s, uh, uh, spoke about uh, fascists uh, 
moving into his country of Ethiopia and uh, being so prescient about what was coming in terms of, of World War II. In any case, in that hall, there was this vote, and uh, I went to go see it. And on my way, I, I, I see the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and he actually had been at my presentation the day before. Uh, it was, again, a day-long conference uh, sponsored by Women's International League for Peace and Freedom uh, at, the, uh, at the U.N. In, uh, in Geneva. And as I spoke about uh, Vision for 2020 and long-range plan and the Star Wars scheme and all this, uh, this horrible history of the U.S. pushing to go up into space with weapons and to dominate space and from space. In fact, that, that's the word that Trump has been using. Uh, Trump has said now over and over again, it's not enough for us to have American presence in space. Trump says we must have American dominance mm -hmm. in space. He's used the word over and dominance in space. And as I say, the rest of the world ain't going to allow this one country, the United States, to, to control space. In any case, I'm walking, this is now years ago, to the U.N. the day after I gave my uh, my keynote speech, and there's the U.S. ambassador who, when I was talking at the, uh, the, the day-long event the day before, there was like daggers in his eyes as I was describing Vision for 2020 and all this other stuff. And, and, but, 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 but he was a diplomat. He was a diplomat, and, uh, and I'm a friendly fellow. And I'm, so I'm walking along the street, uh, in fact, in front of the U.S. Embassy, which is just like on the, down the street from the the UN complex, uh, and it, then, and I'm sure today too, guarded by Swiss soldiers and barbed wire, and oh, what a world uh, uh, that has been created because of conflict. I see this guy, and I wave to him. I'm, again, I'm friendly, and he's a diplomat, and he uh, he calls me over. He waves his hand, and uh, uh, we talk on the street. And, uh, you know, I, I, I say that, you know, my uncles didn't come to this continent of Europe to push for uh, U.S. uber alles, the U.S. overall, for the U.S. to control space and the, the planet below and so forth. This is my, my uncles uh, fought for democracy and they fought against the Nazis. They fought against the my uncles who were in the South Pacific, against the the Japanese fascists and so forth. I mean, what's up here is just terrible. And what, what the ambassador said, and I quote him in, in Weapons in Space, and I quoted him in other, um, uh, in, in other in articles I've written. And later I saw him at the UN in New York, and uh, he had apparently no problem with what uh, he said or what I quoted him saying or whatever. In any case, what he said was, in the wake of the Vietnam War, we can't we can't uh, deploy large numbers of troops. There was so much resistance to the uh, the draft and the deployment of large numbers of troops in the Vietnam War. But we do have this power to deploy, um, project power from space, as he put it, to deploy weapons in space and uh, sort of like automated power without a lot of soldiers. We could... Uh, we could have control over the planet. And I said, you're, you're out of it. I mean, the country is out of it, I, I'm afraid to say, because, uh, you know, I, 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 Russia and China are going to be up there and they're going to meet us in kind. Well, this and is said, the no, insanity. Says, I mean, I, 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 that doesn't sound like a rational thing that the United States has to be the dominant. I mean, you know, the idea that the United States has a right to dominate the entire planet is mentally ill, in, in my view. That's a mental illness. Well, yeah. Well, it, it, then you know, then then I go on. I, you know, in terms of telling them that it ain't gonna ha the U.S. is not going to be able to dominate because Russia and China again, other countries will be up there too. And then he tells me that China is thirty years behind, thirty years behind in terms of space prowess, and Russia doesn't have the money. And I say, look. I've been to China. This is a technological powerhouse, China. Uh, in fact, in recent years, I mean, what it's been doing in terms of its space activities is incredible. I mean, they, they're going to apparently can have some Chinese astronaut on the moon in short order. And as I said, in Russia, I've been to their space museum. It's in Moscow. 
and it's like a like a parallel atomic universe to what what we've done in this country. Uh, some of it is weird, like they have the dogs that they had sent up into space early on. They have them stuffed <laughs> in in the in this in this uh, space museum. But, but they have you know it's it's they don't have the kind of astronauts uniform that our astronauts have. Uh, their cosmonaut uniforms a little different, but it's a parallel universe. And and how are U.S. astronauts, incidentally, these days getting up to the International Space Station. Uh, the Russians are... are so I, just, I, I tell them that, you know, it, it, China has the technological expertise. Russia is rich in mineral resources. I mean, it, it will have the money if it needs... And in any case, uh, we part, you know, with a handshake. And then I, uh, he proceeds, I proceed uh, to the U.N., and then I go to this hall where the vote is being taken on Paros, Prevention and Arms Race in Outer Space, and their country after country votes for it. And then this guy, you know, he's to vote for the United States. Raises his hand, no. The U.S. votes no. And it was it was so, I mean, it, uh, <laughs> as, as a native U.S. citizen, as a... Um, I mean, I, I just <laughs> you, were the US, uh, you couldn't believe that they were just, uh, just saying exercising no. exercising this veto, and where the rest of the world is saying, "Let's keep war out of space." Uh, you know, the U.S. was saying, "No, let's we're going to bring war into space, but we're, we're going to control." Well, Carl, war uh, is the United know, the, States' primary product. That is the reality. We don't make anything except war anymore. In fact, that's why all of our elected officials voted for this budget because every one of, I mean, they have done that where they have funded every single congressional seat has some type of military, major military contract in it. So if you say no to the military budget, you're putting people out of work. I mean, this this is how insidious it is. Our entire people, when they're talking about the you know the space force. I mean, I saw an article yesterday that rolled out the space force uniforms, and people were clamoring because they were camouflage, right? They're camouflage, and the United yeah, yeah. and they said, well, that's because we were trying to save money, which is so ironic because this thing is going to cost us billions of dollars, and they're worrying over not designing a new space uniform. I mean. This goes to show you that what they really plan on doing is militarizing. They have the camouflage uniforms to create the militarized mentality among the soldiers that are in the Space Force. This isn't about peaceful Space Force. This is about we are going to dominate the entire world through brute force. Yeah, and and, and it's a partnership between, oh, well, for example, a, a big proponent of this working uh, hand in hand with uh, Trump was uh, Congressman uh, Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. He's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And, uh, oh, was was he an advocate of the, I mean, he didn't have to even have a deal made for paid parental leave. He's been out front a strong Mm -hmm. advocate of a, a space force. Now, he comes from a district in the state of Washington where there's a certain company called Boeing. Right. Where it's located. And, I mean, we know now after the 737 MAX disaster, uh, the, the idiocy, uh, the, uh, uh, the the incompetence, yeah. uh, the stupidity uh, that Boeing is capable of. And here uh, we're going to have the folks who gave us the 737 MAX with all its defects because, uh, well, as, as this is in recent weeks, uh, all this information coming out, Including from Boeing employees, that there's there's a sick culture at a sick culture at Boeing. Uh, Boeing incidentally is our biggest exporter and so forth. In any case, Adam Smith, who uh, represents, I mean, he's Boeing's congressman. He wants a space force. Uh, the Pentagon has long wanted. Uh, uh, not, not everybody in the Pentagon, incidentally, Mattis was. Uh, uh, when he was uh, up there in, in the White House, he was not hard on the hot on the space force stuff. But basically, uh, the Pentagon has brought this idea uh, through the years now uh, that space is the ultimate high ground, and we got to move up there and from space 
control the planet below. And as I say, it's it's explicit. They talk about uh, the the great empires of Europe uh, controlling the seas. We're going to control space, and thus being able to control the world. Being blind to absolutely blind to the fact that the U.S. is going to be met in kind by countries who don't want to meet us in kind. Uh, uh, speaking again about uh, that UN uh, Geneva experience I yeah. had. Excuse uh, me, Carl, but don't you uh, think that that's in fact exactly what they're banking on? They're banking on the fact that these other nations, A, don't have the money, and B, don't have the political will to combat them, to stop them from getting a firm hold first. So they, I think they feel like once they get it going, these other countries will not be able to catch up, and they will just have to be, you know, at the mercy of the United States. Well, that's a fantasy. They're, they're delusional if they think that. Because when you talk about the two countries that will end up up there and countering us, uh, I mean, when you go to China, anybody who's visited China uh, learns, and you don't learn it in high school in this country, about the uh, how China was invaded and invaded by, uh, I mean, that's why there's the Great Wall of China. They didn't want the Mongols to, right. to invade and so forth. So they're very sensitive to uh, foreign invasion. And in terms of Russia, after the, the Russian Revolution, we were, with other Western countries, a part of uh, an effort to undo the Russian Revolution uh, militarily and so forth. It was a, uh, something that is, is remembered well uh, in, 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 in Russia. They're very sensitive to this. So when Trump talks about American dominance, of space, as I say, this is this is delusional. It's just it's just not going to happen. What needs to happen is that we have to sit down and uh, work on treaties uh, again, expand the outer space treaty, and and say once and for all, uh, keep space for peace. Let's not extend. Let's not bring war up and in, up into the heavens. Uh, for our generation, for future generations, uh, this this is this is such a such a such a bad a bad thing. I mean, Bruce Gagnon, who's coordinator of the Global Network, he talks about bringing the bad seed, the bad seed of war, uh, into into space, and uh, uh, he talks about the the infrastructure which would be uh, uh, developed as as the new pyramids. With us, without, and this is so important in terms of money, and what Bruce describes as the the Achilles heel, all well, the money that yeah. would go, it would have to go, would have to go go, go into this. Uh, Bruce stresses, and we all should kind of be aware: where is the money going to come from? Right. Exactly. And uh, that there's been an industry publications, aerospace industry publications, that have been promoting. Uh, the uh, the weaponization of space, making space a, a new war zone, that uh, it'll a lot of money going to be involved, and the source entitlement programs. I mean, the little that's that's there now, uh, Medicare and and and, and Medicaid and uh, the Social Security check uh, that that folks get, and the other entitlement programs. That's where they're thinking they're going to get the money right. to. Uh, to dominate space, it's 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 going to be paid for by uh, these important poverty, programs that help poverty. humanity. I mean, it's going to be paid for by creating poverty. That's how it's going to be paid for. And frankly, I think it's going to break the bank because one accident up there, or let's say there's something we've got all this money invested in that, and then we do have a major accident on planet Earth. Then what? We don't have the resources to really deal with it. It's it's such a short-sighted program. It's unbelievable. It's an incomprehensibly short-sighted, demonic. In my view, it's quite demonic. It's like they have no regard for life on our planet. So, Carl, uh, and incidentally, not too incidentally, uh, when Gorbachev met with Reagan on a, and, and this shows the intent of the Russians. I mean, uh, to quote, uh, you know, Reagan. Uh, uh, trust but verify. So I, I, I believe in trusting and verifying too. But they came a point in this uh, uh, meeting, the summit meeting 
uh, this has been written about many times, uh, between Gorbachev and Reagan, where Gorbachev said, let's outlaw all nuclear weapons. We, the Soviet Union was still around then, we will be for outlawing all nuclear weapons. They're such, such horrific weapons. I mean, it, 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 even the notion that they could be used, it, it, it's just, uh, it, it, it must be so unbelievably apocalyptic. Yeah. Uh, let's just outlaw. Like, frankly, after World War One, the world decided that chemical warfare was no good, that chemical warfare was horrific. All those tens of thousands of soldiers uh, killed on the battlefield of Europe with chlorine gas and these other chemical weapons. So there were several treaties in the 1920s that prohibited chemical weapons. And I mean, it's not held 100 percent, but it's held about 98 percent. There's, uh, I mean, there, there's been some use of chemical weapons, uh, the Iraqis, the Iranians, and, their, and so forth. But basically, we put that genie back in the bottle. We put the genie of chemical weapons back in the bottle. And the same thing has to happen with nuclear weapons. And here Gorbachev is telling Reagan, we want to do this. And Reagan had, uh, you know, spoke a bit about uh, uh, well, the... Uh, the nightmarish potential and the use of nuclear weapons. He, he, maybe he understands some of it, but the, the problem there in that summit meeting, why this didn't happen, was that Reagan wouldn't wouldn't give up Star Wars. Of course. I mean, again, this has been published many times. He held and 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 Gorbachev said, "Well, you know, the, the U.S. with Star Wars controlling space and being able to dominate the planet, the, you know." No good, no good. Let's let, let's eliminate that. And Reagan wouldn't, and that that, that ended no. that summit. And it, yeah, and and it ended the planet's promise. Well, what uh, year was the vision for twenty twenty written, Carl? Wasn't it written in the fifties? No, no. The vision for twenty twenty goes back uh, to uh, I, I think it's eighty three or something like. So that. around the time uh, when it's not, Reagan not the fifties, right? Yeah, no, no. The Reagan was Star Wars, and that's the early '80s. Uh, I think Vision for 2020. I'm just going to look it up on my computer, but that's uh, a Vision for 2020, U.S. Space Command. I'm looking it up on my computer now. Mm-hmm. I should know, and I have a copy of the report. Yeah, it's and again, you could uh, uh, here's U.S. Space Command Vision for 2020 uh, calls for the U.S. to Dominate uh, space. My, here's a report. Uh, this is from the Global Security Institute, which is a peace organization to be master of space. Incidentally, one of the slogans of the Space Command, and I'm sure this is going to be a major slogan of uh, uh, here is Vision for 2020, issued uh, Vision for 2020, 2002. 2002 talks about full spectrum dominance, global engagement, and so forth and so on. Uh, I think it's sooner so it, than you know, that. It, it, I remember it, it, reading it in your book. It was like in the 70s. It was written by, it was signed by the Congress like in the 70s or the 80s. I remember Oh, that. no, that, 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 that's the different book. That's the different, uh, that, that's military space forces the next 50 years. That's what you're thinking of. Oh, okay, and in okay. that book, you were talking. Also, you were you're talking earlier about that's the, that's the report uh, done by Congress with the blessings of, and it says commissioned by U.S. Congress in the that's front of the right. book. That's right. That's what I was thinking you, you, of. You, you, yeah, you can get it online. I mean, some of this stuff is so nuts that it's hard to believe. That's one of the problems here. Uh, that you know, is it's, exactly and, and also it, Carl. It's hard to believe that. Really, that while we're busy with our lives thinking that our Congress is taking care and being good fiduciaries and responsible caretakers of our safety and well-being, that they're really just being bought out for money purposes to disregard all the threat to life that all of these programs are creating. It's it's incomprehensible, to be honest. It's, yeah. I'm just looking at my computer now, and this is in my book, Weapons in Space. This is how... Vision for 2020 opens like the crawl in the beginning of the Star Wars movie, you know, on black. Yeah. They have the words and they kind of narrow down. 
They do the same thing in Vision for 2020. U.S. Space Command dominating the space dimension of military operations to protect U.S. interests and investment. <laughs> you, I mean, this is not, you know, uh, uh, an issue of, of homeland defense. This is not, you know, they're this pretty is protect- blatant about it. It's just about the money. Well, you know, and here it goes on. Again, I just opened it up on my computer, and, and listeners can do the same thing. Historical perspective. During the rise of sea commerce, nations built navies to protect and enhance their commercial interests. This, this is the, you know, the, uh, the basis for it. During the westward expansion of the continental United States, military outposts and the cavalry emerged to protect our wagon trains, settlements, and railroads. And then it goes on. Here's, here's a chart here. Uh, they talk about uh, uh, from space. We'll put, uh, wow. There's a whole chart here. Protecting U.S. national interests and investment. Oh, and the thing you were talking about regarding the moon, that's in military space forces, which to repeat, you can get it in Amazon so you can see I mean, this, this stuff for yourself. I mean, this is the shocking thing. is like they're making their plans. They're going full steam ahead. And so for an, an, uh, for us to be able to stop it, because it's our nation that's actually making this effort to do this and to start the confrontation in the war on in space, it's actually up to each one of us as citizens to contact your elected officials, contact your state officials, because they do not know. That's a very interesting thing that I, you know, and even if they do know, they think we don't care. So as long as they think we don't care, they're going to continue to listen to the lobbyists who are paying them big money. So I think this is why I think it's very, very, very important to engage with your elected officials, even when you still believe that they have been bought out by the big corporations, because believe you me, they want their jobs. They can't keep their jobs unless we allow them to. And so I think it's very important. And, and Lonnie, let me just go on. I've been scrolling, and as, as listeners can, just go to Vision for 2020 on your computer. Control of space. Control of space is the ability to assure access to space, freedom of operations within the space medium, and an ability to deny others the use of space. Right. And that military space forces book that you had mentioned about blocking people from getting yeah. to the moon because the moon had all the other countries from getting to the moon and mining the moon and so forth. And military space forces, this book, again, commissioned by Congress, has several pages about how the U.S., uh, there's some kind of gravity wells just off the moon. And if we would position weapons in these gravity wells, we could stop. We could actually stop other countries from getting to the moon to mine the cobalt and, to, and so forth and so on, and again that that that, that links that re- links to this uh, this other uh, U.S. document uh, vision for 2020. I mean it's it's all there. It's 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 uh, it's in plain sight what the U.S. Right. is up to, and I don't believe that most Americans want to do this kind of thing. I think of most Americans. I mean, since the uh, the signing of the national uh, and this, this National Defense Authorization Act, which establishes a space force, Reagan, uh, Reagan Trump signed that on December twentieth. I mean, I've been seeing endless amounts of news about uh, Prince Harry right. and 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 his wife Meghan, uh, which is which is interesting. But how much information have folks gotten in this country about what's occurring? This. Uh, uh, the creation of this space force, this uh, right. sort of uh, uh, concluding uh, a and the string fact that of most developments of our elected through the decades. Officials rubber stamped it. Not one, not many of them challenged it at all. I mean, it's been that's well, a really despicable thing. Well, the media, and I'm a professor of journalism. I've been a professor of journalism for 42 years. And and a corny story. I got into it. I was an intern at the Cleveland Press out in Ohio, and above the entrance to the press, I was a, uh, got a job there as an intern as a copy boy, and above the entrance was the slogan, give the people the light and they will find their own way. In fact, that was the slogan of, it is the slogan of the Scripps Howard newspapers, and I was so taken by not seeing 
investigative reporters at the Cleveland Press dig up all kinds of stories and uh, publish these exposés and things being corrected because the media was right there exposing, expose, exposing outrages and dangerous situations and corruption and so forth, the people were given the light and they found their own way. I, I feel if people were given the light about uh, this push by the United States yeah. to turn space into a uh, an arena of war, they wouldn't. They would not stand for it. Uh, and what it's going to precipitate, what it's going to lead to, uh, they would not stand for it. And I, I must say, uh, with all the news about Prince Harry and Meghan, where has there been information on NBC or CBS? Or the, you know, I mean, the well, Times. I mean, don't did you think that's the reason for the news the on Prince Harry and Meghan? I mean. That's kind of the distraction unit, right? Like there, that like none of that is. <laughs> I mean, it's there intentionally because if they don't report on that, then they have, then there's various big voids that need to be filled with real information that will protect us. Mm. So, I mean, and most of the mainstream media is owned by these, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin and by the the war machine. Essentially, they're they're pretty much the same people. So, I mean, this is why they make weapons in space sound like, oh, it might be a great idea. It's not a great idea. It's inhumane. And so, uh -huh. Carl, Carl Weir, at the end of the hour, it has gone so fast. Um, I really want to thank you for joining us. And is there anything that you'd like to leave the listeners with or maybe anything that we could tell them that you'd like, uh, that you think that maybe they ought to be doing? Well, get active. Uh, go to that website. Uh of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, and that's space, www.space4, the numeral 4, peace.org. Uh, go to... Uh, Your website, I do this TV Carl show, Rosen. and in a couple of weeks there'll be a, a show on this, and that's envirovideo.com. Just go to our website, envirovideo.com, and you'll see a number of TV shows I've done through the years. You can watch them right on your computer on on earlier space warfare plans, just go to envirovideo.com. Uh, for example, I did one oh, about 20 years ago now. Star Wars Returns went under George W. Bush uh, and Rumsfeld. There was this effort to revive the, the Reagan Star Wars plan. But just, just, just hit that website or my own personal website. A lot of stuff there, a lot of articles. That's Carl Grossman, call with a K, Carl Grossman, one word, dot com. Yeah, well, that is awesome. Carl, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, and I encourage all of my listeners to get active, do what you can, and definitely, even if you think they're corrupt and they're not listening, still poke them in the eyes and call your elected representatives and tell them no to this. So I appreciate your time, Carl, and I hope to have you back sometime soon shortly. So I really, uh, I have to say, I admire all the work that you have done in regards for helping to save our planet. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us here. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Put your courage feet on, you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye right. now. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts. For art, N U T Z F O R A R T. Thank you for being part of the solution.